Tuesday. I didn't think anything could come faster than Monday came yesterday, but Tuesday got here pretty quick too. I think if you're involved with kids and you're involved in the school system right now, you're just a little tired. And I know, you know I'm a little tired, a little drugged down, a little mentally exhausted. Uh, been an emotional few weeks with the old ball team. But uh, we're here to talk about Jesus. We're here, I think this First John is sort of like Christianity 101. Because what does happen? Once I get saved, you know, what's the plan or what direction do we go in? And uh, I just think this is a very good book to go. After we talk about the 40 things that happened when you got converted, now let's talk about this other thing called how am I going to act going forward or, or what's my game plan going forward? So, Kim, good to see you this morning. I hope you're doing all right. Um, <clears throat> as I was saying, I kind of think of this first John as the uh, sort of like Christianity 101 because sometimes a person gets saved and all of a sudden they think they don't make mistakes anymore. <clears throat> they think that they're better than everybody else. Uh, now, we're in better shape than everybody else. BF Myrtle, good to see you. Because, you know, the person that gets saved, he's going to go to heaven. But let's think about this. Our job when we get saved should be immediately to say, wow, I'm going to go out here and try to tell as many people about Jesus as I can tell them. Because that's what the job is. See, that's the job. Now, you and I, when we got saved, chances are we just wanted to get out of hell. And I understand that because I was right there with you. But something else happened as I started to learn about this plan that Jesus has for our life. And the plan is this, Jesus wants to save you, but he also wants you to go to your family, your friends, and your enemies and say, look, here's what Jesus did for me, and he'll do the same for you. So Sammy, good to see you. Good to see everybody. We'll just march right into it this morning. I think we were getting ready to start the second chapter uh, of First John. Now, uh I think I had read the advocacy of Christ. Now, remember the advocate. Remember that word. An advocate in our present day would be called our lawyer. Good morning, Maureen. Good morning, Karen Midkiff. Great to see everybody out this morning. <clears throat> so the advocate or the advocacy is of Jesus Christ here. And what John's going to say is, look, we don't want you to sin. But I'm going to tell you something about sin a lot of people say, I'm going to stay in my house. I'm not going to get around people. I'm going to quit. You know, I'm just going to withdraw from society in general, which you're sanctified. So you are set apart. So there are going to be some differences and you're not going to be able to go to the places you, you used to go. But at the same time, you've got to understand this. If we don't go out and tell the world about Jesus, there's nobody else going to go. That's the situation. So, Becky, good to see you this morning. I hope retirement is treating you well. We are in 1 John chapter 2 today, and we're talking about the advocacy of Jesus Christ. And what happens is, and what John's going to tell us in this very first uh, verse, he says, My little children, I say unto you that I hope that you sin not. I don't want you to sin. We don't want to sin. But if you sin, here's what we say. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So, <clears throat> if Jesus is my lawyer, can I lose? I cannot lose. But here's the deal. Who would Jesus be a lawyer for? He's only an advocate for the people who are saved. Because if somebody that's not saved is down here acting like a raging lunatic... Jesus doesn't know anything about that, or God doesn't know anything about that. He knows that you're, you've, you've got a sin nature, and you just keep piling the sins up on your shoulders, right? But you don't have any representation in heaven. Think about this for a sec, because if this advocacy thing is correct, and I believe it to be, see, John is saying, look, you have a... A, a, a lawyer in heaven who is Jesus, and he's he's also your high priest, which is taking your prayer request to God. So you've got this powerful representation, and do we even use it? Well, how would I use this? Well, I would use it through, Lord, show me what I'm doing wrong. Show me what I'm thinking that's wrong. Show me what I'm saying that's wrong. And then when those things come to my mind, I'm like, whoa, I should not have said that. Man, I shouldn't have acted like that. And, and all of these things, right? All of these things, uh, I have to, I have to be 
you know, what would you say um, I have to be sensitive to? Or, you know, for example, I tell you, I didn't have a conscience before I got saved. Well, then I get saved, and guess what? Now, all of a sudden, when I hurt somebody's feelings or did something to somebody else, now it means something to me. But before, it didn't hurt me to hurt you. I mean, I didn't care. I just hurt your feelings and go on. Well, you ought to toughen up a little bit. But when I got saved, it was a little different. See, things just started happening differently. And one of those reasons that happens differently is because this Holy Spirit is inside of me. And sometimes I don't know how to communicate with God. I don't know how to pray to God. But this Holy Spirit can communicate to Jesus, who is my advocate. You ever watch these law and order type dramas where the lawyer says, here's what you need to do. And the guy says, I'm not pleading guilty to this, or I'm not saying I did or didn't do whatever it is. And the lawyer says, let me explain the base, best case scenario to you. If you don't do this, you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. If you do do this, there may be a chance you get out on parole someday. Same thing with Jesus. See, I don't have any kind of a prayer life with Jesus till he hears me say, I, I, I'm begging you to forgive me of my sins, or please forgive me of my sins, or however you want to do it, forgive me of my sins. That's what Jesus wants to hear first. Then this opens up your prayer life, and then this is when Jesus becomes your advocate. So once again, let me read these first two verses to you. This is 1 John chapter 1, or chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So once again, who's Jesus? Jesus is your lawyer. He's also your high priest. Where is he at? He sits at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing there? He is, you know, I guess you would say number two in charge, or of course there's one God that we worship in three persons. But the other thing is, he's got the ear of the Lord. So when the devil comes accusing well, you don't know what Doug did. Well, you don't know what Denver did. Well, you don't know what blah, blah. You know, look, Jesus leans over. He says, and boys got saved. You know, when when they come and say Lunsford teaching Sunday school, that's the dumbest thing ever. Well, you don't know what that guy's done. And Jesus leans over and says, March 1997, old Lunsford surrendered to us. He's one of, he's one of our people, right? Is he perfect? Absolutely not. I mean, even my head's not perfectly round, even as bald as it is. You know, it looks more square than round, right? Just a little humor. So, there we go. We've got an advocate. We've got representation in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't sit around thinking about that very much. That just popped into my head. Not only does Jesus say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to live in your heart to help you get more like me and one day see me in heaven. But he also says, you're going to have, I've already got representation in heaven. Isn't that amazing? I think it is. So, and if he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also the sins of the whole world. So the propitiation is, is that Jesus here was the atoning sacrifice. So once again, if a lot of people or anybody were to come and tell you, I... There's a lot of ways to get to heaven. Ah, you don't need to worry about Jesus. Oh, yeah, you need to worry about Jesus because of right here. Because he is the propitiation for our sins. Okay? He is the one <clears throat> who had the perfect blood that was accepted by God to be the sacrifice for the sins of yesterday, today, and forevermore. So that's what makes this thing so amazing. Good morning, Sandy. Good to see you. So, the propitiation, or, or the atoning sacrifice, this is why in the Old Testament, we just came out of the book of Exodus, we talked about the lamb being sacrificed, we talked about the care of the lamb, how they loved on the lamb, treated that lamb more like a pet, took it into the house, cleaned him up, spent X amount of days with him, and then they prayed about it, and then they sacrificed this, this lamb, covered the doorpost, remember the Passover, now, where's the Passover today? John the Baptist told us, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. So when John the Baptist recognized who Jesus was, did John recognize it because John knew everything? No. John recognized it because he was sold out to the things of God. He was the forerunner that had been talked about of Jesus Christ. 
He was going to look and act a whole lot like Elijah. And here he is. He recognizes the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. How does sins get taken away? I ask God to remove them. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. Remission and forgiveness. You can interchange them. So we could never have gotten the forgiveness unless the lamb dies. Now, what's the importance of Jesus dying? Well, Jesus was fully God, but yet that somehow he was fully man. So at the end of this, all of these different trying to figure this thing out, we've got to understand we have a God that loved us enough to die for us. Now, we have a lot of denominations, well, not denominations, but a lot of religions of the world <clears throat> that have founders. Let's take Buddha. Let's take Muhammad. Let's take, I don't even know, uh, Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, I think was the founder of that. And, and they're men that came up with these ways of thinking. They started indoctrinating people to certain ways. You know, and for long they had a following, for long they had a church, for long they started getting in your pocketbook, right? Because that's really, if you got to be honest on some of this stuff, that's all they were trying to do was get you to depend on them to where you, you'd support them. But anyway, but with Jesus, what we've got is, think about this, we've got one God operating in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I've always thought about that cross, okay? I've thought about God the Father being up at the top, one of the arms of the cross being the Son, and one of the other arms being the Holy Spirit. And that cross comes together right there where them two pieces of board, right? No matter how they did it or whatever, there's how that cross came together. And I think of you and me being right in the center of the cross. We got protection from the Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've got Jesus who has come and he's died for my sins. He's gone to prepare a place for us. He's not left us comfortless because on the other side of this thing is this Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit's living inside of me. Now I can do all these amazing things. See, and you say, what, you do miracles? No, that's not the kind of amazing things I can do. But I can read this book because all of a sudden this is my book now. See, a lot of people read the Bible and just never get it because it's not their book. Because their God is not the God that wrote the book. See, if you're not willing to be God's chosen person, or if you're not willing to be a son or a daughter of God, this Bible won't do anything for you. That's why it confounds people so amazingly, because a lot of people pick up this Bible and start talking about, I mean, it had it happened in a class the other day, a teacher made the statement, the Bible's the most gruesome book that was ever written, you know, or the most you know, vengeful, or what was it? The most violent, I think she said. The most violent book that was ever written. Okay, but why was it? See, it's the history of the world in this book. Okay, biblical history. Why does God say go into this village and destroy every man, woman, child, and kill every animal they've got? Well, because he's a righteous judge and he knew what these people had done wrong and he was able to say it, right? How come... Our God gives this land to these Israelite people when these other people were clearly in there. Well, the reason he did that is because this land was designated for them, and I don't care how long we live or how many bombs go into Israel today, that's their land, and they're going to get that land. Okay? So everybody that comes against those people is coming against God because that's God's chosen people. See? So again, you know, the teacher made a statement of if a book needs to be, we were talking about books that are banned. She said the Bible is, is the most violent book that's ever been written. Um, should it be banned or, why, or, you know, why don't we ban it? Well, many people have tried to ban the Bible. Many people have changed the translations of the Bible. Uh, many people don't want to talk about the Bible. Why? Because it's got the keys to your eternal life. And there's nothing that the devil would love more than for you to just say, well, I'm not going to worry about the Bible anymore. I'm not going to read it. I'm not even going to carry it to church. Some churches don't want you to take your Bible to church. They want to hand you a handout. You've got to be careful with that. Be into a few of those over the years. In my little preaching and uh, Gideon speaking career, uh, they want to hand you something. And I'm like, well, I don't know about that. You know, we want to study something other than the Bible. Well, listen, when I get to where I know the Bible well enough, I may look at something else, but till then, I think I'm going to stay with the King James Study Bible with these doctrinal footnotes, right? 
Okay, so he is the propitiation. He is the atoning soul, person, you know, God. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So as John writes this, <clears throat> this is probably from a sermon that he's given and he writes this down, but he's telling those that are with him, he's like, look what Jesus has done. Jesus is the propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of you all, for the sins of me. All my sins are paid for in, in the work that Jesus has done, but not only is it our sins, but Jesus is paying the sin debt for the whole world. Now we go to verse 3. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So again, there's a bunch of people running around out here in this world today. Oh, I believe in God. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. Well, you believe right here. But do you believe to action? And you know, you've heard that thing, here's a call to action. Do you believe all the way to action? Because this is what this is saying. It says, hereby, if we know Jesus... We're going to keep his commandments. The, the Ten Commandments? Well, sort of. But what was the Great Commandment? The Great Commandment was love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Are we keeping that commandment? Because if I love somebody, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to let them down. I don't want to fall short of the standard that they're setting. I want to do what they need me to do. See, that's where we're at in this thing. So, we know God if we keep his commandments. I'm reading this Bible. I'm studying. I'm trying to learn more. Some people say they got saved. Maybe they did get saved. But they never progress. Their, their growth is stunning. They never go back to Sunday school. They never want to hear preaching. They never want to get back into things. They just think in their mind that they have tricked God. Or they've tricked the church into giving them $200 for their gas bill. Or whatever it might be. See, we always are playing games thinking that God's not smart enough to figure it out or we think we're smarter than we are. See, but the truth is, and John just completely lays it out here, look, you say you love God, you'll keep his commandments. What's the great commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. The second commandment is like unto the first. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Jacob Walsh, do you love anybody like you love yourself? Now, let's be honest. You probably do. You do a great work. Uh, for the Lord in, in our area. But let's think about this thing. Man, do we love anybody like we love ourselves? We probably don't. It's pretty interesting if we'll really stop and think about this. We really don't love anybody like we love ourselves. So there's a reason that's there. Okay? So, the genuine knowledge of God is obedience to his commandments. I want to be obedient to Jesus. Why? Because he could put me in hell. <clears throat> Why? Because I deserved hell. Why am I so thankful to be saved? Because for 30 years I did it my way, and my way was the wrong way. My way was the way to hell. But God had all that mercy and, and allowed me to be so stupid and allowed me to do my own thing and allowed me to be everything the prodigal son was until that one afternoon in March of 1997 when I came to myself. See, when I came to myself, things began to change. Did I change? Absolutely. But how did I change? I changed when I started seeing what God had done for me. That after all the craziness that I had led into my life and all the bad choices that I was made making, the moment I called out for the Lord, guess who was there? The Lord. Now, a lot of people, it took a little while for them to understand. All oh, my family was thrilled to death that I got saved. They were thrilled to death because I was under such conviction that my own family doesn't even want to see me come. But man, I get saved. I get in church. I get to taking grandma to church. Well, if you ever start taking grandma to church, you don't miss Right? Why? Because grandma knows you need to go to church. And you're going to go. Pretty interesting, isn't it? So, he that saith, I know Jesus and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth's not in you. Once again, going back to a little bit of chapter one. See, what's the situation? The situation is, 
Oh, I love Jesus. Well, how come you don't do the things Jesus wants you to do? Well, I don't know what Jesus wants me to do. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love other people like you love yourself. Those are the first two. Those are the big two. Oh, I thought he meant don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't covet, don't commit adultery, don't take God's name in vain. Have no other God before me. Make no graven images. Honor mother and father. Oh, yeah, he meant that too. That's just extra. See, because if I love the Lord, I don't want anything, any image or any God in front of my God, right? And my actions, sometimes you honor your mother and father by the way you act. Sometimes the way you act doesn't honor your mother and your father. You ever stop and think about that? See, we have a father who art in heaven, right? And once again, my actions, if I do stupid stuff, if I do something that's just absolutely beyond, beyond ignorant, What's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen here is God, I, I've let him down. See, I've, I've got a mistake. This, that, the other. Okay. So, if I tell you in my mind, or I tell you that, oh, yeah, I know all about God, or I'm fine with the Lord, everything's good with me and the Lord, okay, but I don't keep his commandments, then I'm a liar and the truth's not in me. Because that truth, that Holy Spirit that's living in me now, man, it's telling me when I do the wrong thing now. And as I've told you from the start, he didn't tell me this in the beginning. Are you with me? In the beginning, when I was going through all this, you know, when I was starting my walk with the Lord, man, I didn't know all this stuff. But I did know I got out of hell. So there was one of my 40 things that happened at conversion. I get out of hell. I escape from myself. I escape from the grasp of the devil. And I set on a new path toward hell. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? So he that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk even as Jesus walked. All right, well, man, what am I going to do when I have a problem today? Am I flying off the handle and getting crazy on somebody? Could happen. Especially if somebody gets up on me or gets in my face or something. I have a tendency I can snap back. I'm better than I used to, right? But look. We need to walk just like Jesus. How did Jesus say to walk? He said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep amidst the wolves. Be ye therefore wise as the serpent and harmless as the dove. And that's, that's an interesting story there. I send you forth as sheep amidst the wolves. How many wolves does it, I mean, sheep, does it take to take down a wolf? I don't think it's possible, right? But number one, he said, I'm going to send you forth as sheep. So a sheep against wolves, that's plural. So he's going to send you out against more than just even one wolf. Even one wolf probably take down several sheep. Might take him a little time. He'd have to do it one at a time. But now he says, I'm going to send you out against numerous sheep or wolves. So you better be as wise as the serpent. Well, how wise was the serpent? It says in the book of Genesis there, chapter 3, he was the wisest of all the animals of the field. But then, in all my wisdom, i got to be as harmless as a dove. Think about that for a second. So to walk with the Lord, that's what we're talking about in this thing. All right. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but I write an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. So once again, what's John trying to tell us? Listen, this ain't changed. From the beginning, God wanted a relationship with his people, and he's going to have it. And you are kicking against God's plan if you don't get into this relationship with Jesus Christ as soon as you can get there. That's what makes this thing scary, is we have a world full of people, and some of them have a head knowledge of the Lord, but they're just not coming to that point where the Lord needs them to be not getting to where we need to be. So there's no new commandment. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which is this, which is true in you and in you, because which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness even until now. So wait a second. You know, are we really, do, do we not love our, you know, 
brethren, if we hate our brethren, if we hate, now is this brother meaning a brother in Christ? I don't know. I didn't really research that out. Okay. Um, I think it basically is talking about without compassion for others, you see, we're failing to love. You can't fulfill what Jesus wants you to fulfill. Have you ever met a bitter Christian? Have you ever met an older Christian that wanted to boss everything that just, you know, and it was so sad for so long uh, and, and it just it just tears you up? Or a, a Christian that has a little bit of power in the world out there and maybe he's got a high position and, or maybe he's a politician and he comes into your church and he gets saved and he starts out good, but before long that power and that corruption and his need to be in charge just trickles back into things and you see here there's no compassion for others there's no caring for other people see the whole idea of your church is we all come together there but there's only one church no matter which building you go to around town there's one church and Jesus is the head of it if Jesus is not the head you don't have a church you have a club see all right I think I set my clock at 7.25, but if I'm, if I'm past 7.25, if somebody would tell me, that'd be wonderful. So he that loveth his brother abides in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. So once again, um, he that has faith, okay, he that saith or, or abides in the light, okay, because he's not going to be stumbling around because his actions show that he cares about people. I've been as honest with you as I know how to be. I really didn't care much about other people. I really didn't care if I hurt your feelings or not. I didn't really care if you needed something or not. You know, the last thing I was going to ask you before I got saved is, hey, what can I do for you? Okay. Think about that for a second. So let's move a little further. He that loves his brother abides in the light. You want to live in the light? You want to be what Jesus wants you to be? Love and care about other people. Don't love and care about the people that you're trying to kiss up to to get a promotion at work. Love somebody that can never do anything for you. Love somebody that needs a helping hand. Love somebody that needs some support. That's why if you can volunteer in a school system, if you can go... I mean, it don't have to be volunteer. I mean, they pay me to teach school. Maybe they'll pay you to do something. But you can interact with these kids, and these kids need that. These kids need this interaction, I'm telling you. So, that's where we're at. But he that hates his brother is in darkness, walks in darkness, and knows not whether he goes because that darkness has blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. See, my sins aren't forgiven me because of anything I ever did. My sins are forgiven me because the name of Jesus, which is above all names, is the name I called on and asked him to forgive me of my sins. And Jesus could forgive me of my sins because he shed the blood that satisfies God's, that satisfied God's need to have the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin and his blood was so perfect that it died for the sins of the whole world. Man. And again, he writes, from the beginning, from the beginning, from the beginning. See, God has never changed. From the beginning, from the beginning. So I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. So again, what in the world is he talking about? Notice how he's catching every age group here. See, God's interested in the young people. God's interested in the old people because everybody's got a different education level to go tell somebody about Jesus. So our job here is to understand that God's got a plan for your life. I'll take Lauren since she's on here. A very good gal who is a good friend of my daughter's getting ready to graduate, getting ready to go out of here into this great big crazy world. Jesus has big plans for your life, right? Well, what, what's Lauren going to do? I have no clue what her career goal is going to be. 
but I know she's been in church. I know she understands the things that God needs her to do. And she's going to go out here and tell people about Jesus. She said, well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not going to tell people. Yeah, we all going to tell people about Jesus because we all care about other people and we want to know that they're going to go to heaven someday. See, that's what this thing's all about. We want everybody to go to heaven. We want everybody to be where they need to be for Jesus, to be in church, to learn what they need to do and do the things Jesus wants them to be doing. All right, I'm afraid I might be getting past my time limit. I don't know why my clock maybe I didn't set the clock I looked at it maybe I didn't set it so anyway we got a roll we got a thing kicks me off for just a second but listen we appreciate you Lauren again congratulations on your graduation we wish you nothing but the best in, in, in this whole thing uh, but stay close to Jesus everything else will work out everything else is going to be fine all right folks let's go be a blessing to the world today have a wonderful day we'll see you soon Lord, we're thankful that we have a chance to spend time with you this morning. And we get a really easy look in 1 John of what it's all about from the beginning, from the beginning. You've had a plan from the beginning and it has not changed. Our biggest thing we can do is love other people. You've shared it with us in the Bible in numerous places. Love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And the love that we have towards you and seeing all that you've done for us is going to make us want to love other people, care about other people, and do things for other people. That's what makes this thing wonderful. So, Lord, again, forgive us where we fail you. Be with each prayer. Each heart here has a ton of prayer requests on them. Look at each heart here this morning and see every prayer request that is being made. Also, Lord, we'd ask for you to be with our prayer list, which has our men and women in the military all over the world and their families on our prayer list. The family is a big part of the military uh, program, and we need the families to support their soldiers. We need the families uh, and the soldiers to be faithful. Our veterans and their families, we've got veterans. We've got people that have served our country that need help, and we need to help them. And whatever it is, we need to help these men and these women. Our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responders, our community frontline heroes, we need to, we need to protect these people. We've got to have law and order in our communities. Without law and order, we have nothing. And Lord, I'm hoping and praying that uh, you will allow us to have law and order. I'm hoping and praying you'll intervene in the course of human history and prolong the days. Don't prolong the days for me. I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. I know our Sunday school class, a lot of people on here, I've heard their testimony. I believe they're saved. But Lord, there's so many that aren't where they need to be this morning. I hope and pray you'll give them time. If they're out of fellowship, lay it on their heart just to come back to you. If they've never asked you to forgive them of their sins, let this be the morning when they say, I want to be saved and I want to know for sure that I'm saved. Be with our school kids. A lot of kids are getting out of school. They're going to have a lot more freedom. Protect them and be with them and guide them. Our teachers... We ask for you to be with them. A lot of them are burned out. It's that time of year, man. It's hard to make it go because a tidal wave called kids just keep bringing the, 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 the wave. And, and it's hard to keep fighting it. It is. It just, and it's three more weeks of it. So it just gets tougher and tougher. And the kids get harder and harder just because of the lack of discipline from home, the lack of discipline in the children's lives and different things. So. Our medical community needs a lot of prayer. There's a lot going on and lots of new nurses in the job places. And uh, there's a lot of good ones. But there's a lot that really have to get up to speed quick because there's a, there's a bunch of them that retired. A bunch of them got burned out and said, I can't do this anymore. So, Lord, I pray that they get rested up and get back uh, to the ministry of nursing, just like I believe teaching and nursing are both ministries. Uh, for people, I don't believe they're jobs for everybody. But, Lord, I know that you know what we need there. So, Lord, we lay it all on you and, and allow you to forgive uh, the sins that we have committed. We're thankful to know that you forgave the sins of yesterday, today, and forevermore. But it's our job to recognize the sin that's in our life and to ask you to forgive us. So, again, we love you. We ask you to, again, forgive us where we fail you. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we appreciate you guys so much. Y'all have a wonderful day, and we hope to see you in the morning.